Well, the Purdue Boilermakers are in their first Final Four since 1980, and we are here to talk about that, talk about the matchup against NC State, and then a potential final national championship matchup against uh, Sonny Believes UConn. And uh, and and that's the only option he gave us is UConn or UConn. So um, I speak from welcome, experience, by the way. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he knows his basketball. So, all right. Welcome everybody to the Big Ten Show. Uh, we are going to go over, as y'all see, the Purdue Boilermakers basketball run here in the March Madness tournament. Since Nebraska's run, you know, we had a good run. It went it went really well for us. So um, we're here. We're here with Joe Jackson. Joe, how you doing today? I'm good. I'm feeling good. I'm excited to be here. Excited for the final four and uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Of course. Appreciate you being here. Do you want to tell the people where they can find you, uh, your socials and stuff like that? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB. Do um, a lot of just like film breakdown stuff, film clips, um, and then YouTube feed the post it's called. Um, and that's where I have like full length. I've put up full length scouting reports for pretty much, I think pretty much every big 10 game in the tournament. Um, and we'll just kind of continue into that type of stuff in the off season. Links will be in the description for all of his stuff. So, And I will mention, uh, some of you are carryovers from my other show, Illini Cast, so you're familiar with Joe now. But uh, for those of you who are not, he does absolutely fantastic work on Feed the Post. Uh, it's one of my go-tos. Uh, I'm unlike Justin and unlike Joe when it comes to you know the whole analytical side of sports. So me just learning from them, uh, it's, it's a side of a game that I'm not familiar with. So I consider it a super valuable piece of uh uh, material if you're into that sort of thing or even if you're not you know, if you're if you just want to learn uh definitely look it up for sure but, but to joe okay so let's just kind of start off you know obviously purdue basketball uh you've been you've had high expectations coming into this season and a lot of it has to do with what happened last season uh it's been a hectic i saw you you're hanging out in detroit and i think you're going to phoenix right now is that right Yes, that is. I will. I'll be there in just a couple of days. What's this 2024 season been like for a Purdue fan? I mean, it's been well. The entirety of the season has been crazy in general. These past few days has been insane. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just there's just so much pressure this year, right? Of uh, we all know what happened last year, and the you know that's all the talk, and rightfully so. That, that should be the talk in the whole off season. Um, but that was the pressure. I mean, you saw Purdue had four losses this year, and like after each loss, it was it was like it was a meltdown. Um, and but they're able to do what they needed to do. And, and I think for the players specifically on this team, like you just saw, you there's two things. You saw how much this meant to them, but you also saw that like they really do have the jobs not finished mentality. Um, even I mean, leading up to the Elite Eight, there was zero celebration after the first three wins. Even this, I, I, there was I don't know if it made it past like Purdue Twitter, but there was a clip of you know they put like the the names on the board when you advance. Like after the Sweet Sixteen win, Miles Colvin, the freshman, he put it up and like he he just like gave a thumbs up and there was no applauding. Like it was very much um, like this is what you're supposed to do. And in their heads, they were supposed to make a Final Four. In their heads, they're supposed to win a national championship. Um, it was good to see them, like, after the Final Four, be after the win, just be able to finally let out some emotion. Um, you saw Edie run up and hug Painter right away. Gillis was emotional. I mean, even the former players coming on, like Robbie Hummel, who was on the radio. Um, and, you know, Robbie's one of the best in the business at being professional in that, but he just couldn't control it. Like, the tears just start coming down, and, and you could just see how much it meant for this team and, and everybody involved, the fan base. I mean, it was – like, Tennessee fans travel well. Like, they, they do, and it was 85-15 Purdue fans in Detroit. It, it, there was a couple times I thought it was louder than Mackey. It was crazy. Yeah, that is wild. So, I guess, you know, overall, just kind of what is the – Coming into the tournament, what was the what was the feeling from the Purdue fan base? Did did, did y'all feel like this was a team that could make this run? Did y'all feel like this was finally the the uh, the team that would do it? And what was kind of the overall feeling of why this team was different as opposed to last uh, last few years? Yeah, I mean, I think when the the draw came out, it was kind of like, hey, this this sets up for Purdue. Obviously, once you get to the Elite Eight, you you're just gonna have to play a good team. That's how the how the tournament works. Right? At some point, you have to play good teams. Um, I think the Gonzaga or Kansas Gonzaga um, Gonzaga has been playing, had been playing really well. So it wasn't like Purdue expected to walk over them, but like, it was like, Hey, those aren't the most difficult four or five matchups in the world. 
excuse me. And then like, yeah, I, I think the expectation was at minimum elite eights and probably if I would assume most fans expected at least a final four, um, like just the way that the tournament broke and, and how this team is. And, and obviously Zach Eady, best player in the country, national player of the year again, all that stuff. But there's the, I mean, Brain Smith has emerged as one of the elite point guards in the country. And now you have like, the, the Tennessee game is the perfect Lance Jones example of he was really bad offensively for 38 minutes. And then he knocks down the biggest three. He airballed his first two threes, knocks down the biggest three of the game in a game that nobody could hit a three for Purdue. Um, and then also played, I would say pretty good defense in the second half on connect connect still gets his, but that's because he's, Hey, the second best player in the country. Um, but I, I okay that's fair that's fair <laughs> no fair enough sorry I, I... Top, he's he's one he's top five guaranteed probably top three and, and oh, a lot of people have him top two but um <laughs> going back to Purdue it's just like the the guards it's the guards and the confidence and some of it comes from Lance Jones some of it comes from uh Brain Smith and Fletcher Lawyer being now sophomores and not freshmen I mean and you can just see like like the neither Brain Smith just doesn't take anything like he's just like I don't know. He's just a winner. It's what he is. He is a winner. If you go back and watch his high school film, he's the same way. And he's going to let you know that he's a winner. He's going to make plays that very few people in the country can make. Um, and then also shooting uh, just in general. Purdue's, I think, I know they didn't shoot well against Tennessee, but number, second best three point shooting team in the country. Um, surround all that with Zach Eady is where you can win the Tennessee game. That was their worst three point shooting game of the entire season, Purdue. And they won in the biggest game of the year. Um, and that's because Zach Eady put up 40. So a lot of those kind of factors go in. And then also just the other thing that I've loved about this Purdue team is from day one, they never ran from the FDU loss. They, you know, it was never like we're moving on. It was, no, we have to sit in that. We have to accept that that happened. We have to come back and be better. And they did. And now they're here. So let's yep. kind of talk about the guy in charge of the program before we uh, really head into the preview of the final four. You know, obviously 2021, you lost to number 13 seed, North Texas. 2022, number 15 seed, St. Peter's. Uh, last year, we mentioned this already, number 16, uh, Farley Dickinson. If you lose this year to number 11 seed, NC State, do we fire Matt Painter? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> just... Tell me about like you know his growth as a as a coach leading your program for 19 years now. You know, like uh, he's reaching the territories where he's got to be considered one of the arguably the greatest coach in your tenure or in your history. Even though you have and you guys have some great, fantastic coaches uh, that lineage. So, just tell me about Matt Painter a little bit now. I mean, yeah. Um, the only thing the only thing lacking, and it was a big thing from his resume, was this deep march run. Um, when you look at what he's able to build from year to year basis, I mean, he, especially these, I, I like, I know the postseason losses are there. You cannot ignore them. I'm not saying that, but like what he's done these past few years with pretty under recruited guys, Zach, I mean, everybody knows Zach, Eadis, 440. Braden Smith was close to 200, I believe. Um, Fletch was like a hundred and hundred ranked. I mean, like these aren't dudes that are, you know, five stars, four high, four stars, like they are dudes that fit the culture and it goes to what painter does. I mean, there's just so many little things that that painter does to make sure that these players fit basketball wise, but also just from a personality standpoint. And I mean, he's mentioned it before he'll, he sits down and does personality tests with the players to understand, like, do you fit in our program? And then if you do, how can I like reach you better? How can we all work together better? Um, just things like that. Um, and now just, I mean, I'm sure there was fans, uh, Purdue fans that, that thought it would never happen. But at the end of the day, when you put yourself in these spots, you know, multiple years in a row, like it's going to happen eventually was, was kind of my thought. Like you, you put yourself as the top three seed multiple, like it's just going to happen eventually. And this was the year that it finally happened. Um, obviously helps have an ED, but he's also just been, I think he's been a little more flexible this year of he doesn't like, obviously the, the offense still runs through the post as it should, because you have Zach Eady, duh. But it's he's allowing Brain Smith to run more pick and roll. He's around allowing Brain Smith to be more free. He's allowing Lance Jones to push the ball. He's allowing these guys to put up threes. So like, um, it's he's understood that like he has to adjust, and that was a big thing for him this off season. Was just like he was like most of these players they haven't been here for you know two of those uh, bad losses or most of these bad losses. There's been one common denominator, and he's like it's me. 
And so um, I think he's taken that to heart and been able to adjust to it's, it's been, it's been great to see. And um, I, I truly think nobody, nobody deserves it more than painter at this moment. Yeah. So looking at the NC state matchup coming up um, yesterday, I, I saw it was a plus nine and a half um, for NC state. Uh, and so your feeling on that spread, do you think that's too much, too little? Um, you know, seeing as NC State's run has been pretty improbable with the way that they came about getting in the tournament, you know, a couple of uh, easier early uh, matchups. And then, of course, the Duke game um, where they, you know, did what they did. It was such a surprise. You know, DJ Burns kind of took the uh, take of the nation by storm a little bit. So are there, you know, do you see that as is any matchup problem? And do you think that spread is is fair? Or do you think, you know, do you think that NC State is going to give um, you know, a lot of problems or, or any matchups in particular that you think are, are an issue? I think when I just think about it, like no biasness, then I think the line that feels about right, like nine ish, nine, 10 points um, in my head. This it goes like NC State hangs for 20 minutes and Purdue kind of. I don't know if they ever like run away with it, but they at the end of the day you look up, it's like, oh, they have an eleven point win. Um, that's kind of how it goes. But then this is the first, and it's probably just because it's the final four. This is the first time this tournament as just like a pure Purdue fan where I'm like, I'm I'm nervous a little bit. I wasn't like ahead of the Gonzaga and Tennessee games. I was like, God, like Purdue's gonna win these. Um, and I still believe that, but I, I think it's the final four nerves getting to me a little bit of like, well, I guess anything can happen. Um, the DJ Burns ED matchup will be a ton of fun. I, I don't know what NC State will do because they have not doubled the post all year. And so do they start doubling? And that's where, I mean, it, it's if you don't double the post and the first time you're going to do it is against Zach Eady, like you either have to have an insane week of practice or like stuff just, it's just not going to go well. Um, so that'll be interesting. But then there's the other side of that too of does Purdue leave Eady one on one with Burns? They've been kind of doing. Their post defense has mainly been where whoever's guarding the the post up big, they force him baseline, and then the other big rotates under the rim and kind of it's not like a hard double, but it's you're right there. Um, and so, but Burns can, I mean, Burns is the best passing big man in the country probably. I, I can't think of any off there off the top of my head, um, or at least specifically from the post as well. So like he can eat up those double teams. Um, I think the other thing will be like. Well, there's two other things that, that kind of stand out is the three point shooting because NC State is like teams just have not shot well against them from three. Marquette was like what four of thirty one from three or something like that in their game. I don't think Duke shot well from three. Like it's just yeah, they teams have not shot well against NC State. Um, Purdue's like I said, the second best three point shooting team in the country right now, percentage wise. They have legitimately four, five, six dudes that can like your confidence can knock down a three. Um, so how does that play out? And then the guards for NC State, they are especially like Horn. He is a dude that can go create his own shot. He can get downhill. He can get to the mid-range. And that's kind of what Purdue wants to give up. They want to give up those mid-range jumpers. They want to allow those floaters. Um, so we've seen it with like Boo Booey and things like that before where it's these guards can really get going because that's what Purdue gives up. Is it going to be enough to keep up though with Purdue? Now, usually in the NCAA tournament, you have those Cinderella stories where teams come out of nowhere uh, you know, the national media gets to talk to them, uh, talk about them for a week, uh, maybe two weeks. But then the final four, it's kind of the Titans just kind of take care of business. Now, obviously, this didn't happen last year, but, you know, nine, it seems about nine and a half seems about what the spread probably should be. But I kind of see it going the way you do. I think, you know, these lights are a little bit brighter um, in the final four. And so Purdue, you know, I mean, if any team's not going to be affected by that, it probably is Purdue, just with the business mentality that they've had all season long. But at the bottom line, they're still just kids. And so yep. you can yep. see, you know, at least uh, opening tip off jitters and, you know, the game might be closer than it needs to be. But like, I guess the expectation is for Purdue, do you ultimately, are like, are you worried that, there's any chance of rust or, or, you know, actually, let me just rephrase that, you know, like you guys going away from the game plan that is basically won every single game for you this year, like any sort of, you know, weird March madness magic you think can happen. I mean, anything like at this point, anything can happen. Like I, I think Purdue wins, but NC state absolutely can come out and win this. Or if NC state just can't miss a jumper, like stuff like that happens in a one game sample size. Um, in terms of the game plan and stuff, like, Purdue's just been so disciplined all year. 
Um, there's really been like out of their four losses, Northwestern one was just like it was whatever. Um, Northwestern shoots well, Purdue shoots terrible. Nebraska won, Nebraska shoots lights out. That Ohio State loss was the one where it was just like Purdue came out and it was just like not playing well. Um, and then the, the Wisconsin one in the Big Ten tournament is is what it is. Um, I don't think Purdue fans at all were mad about that loss, to be 100% honest. So, like, they've played 37 games, and we'll say 1.5 is where they've come out and just been like, like, you aren't, like, this is not Purdue. Um, it'll be interesting to see, though, because I, I could see it going either way, where it's like, these are, they're finally at the final four now. And so it's like that the lights are, are super bright. Does that affect them at all? Um, but does it go the other way now where it's, they have this huge just burden lifted off their shoulders of like, they've gone past all the jokes and the memes and all that of losing to the 16 seed and they're at the final four now. And so can, do they just come out and play free? Um, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities too, where it's just like Purdue, like, like I said, I, I said what I think will happen, but it wouldn't shock me if Purdue comes out and hits six threes in the first 10 minutes or something. And it's like, oh, well, this isn't a game. Um, It'll be interesting to see. I don't have, like, I don't, I don't know which one will happen. I'm obviously hoping for the second one, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, we we kind of had some of that. Where you know, with me being an Illini fan, you know, for us the burden was just getting to that second weekend. And once we did, uh, I wasn't sure how we would show up against Iowa State. But if you watched any of that Iowa State game, the game was over almost at tip off. Uh, there was really no doubt who the better team was. I think that burden was just lifted. And the guys were having fun out there, and Terrence Shannon was having fun out there. But, you know, going back to your game, obviously the nine-point spread, if we were looking into the future right now and then we saw that NC State had won the game, what is the game script that NC State needs to run in order to come out victorious? Yeah, so you're going to need Purdue to not shoot the ball well. It's just, it is what it is. Um, on, on our, I do a Purdue show as well, Boilers in the Stands, like we've kind of been saying all year, you have to play a pretty perfect game against Purdue. Like, I mean, even you look at Tennessee, Purdue didn't shoot the ball well, but it didn't, like, they still find ways to win. The only exception I'm going to throw out there is UConn, um, for obvious reasons. They're, they're a team that does not play a perfect game to beat anybody right. in the country. Uh, but it's it's going to be, NC State gets their guards going, right? Horn probably has 20 points, and then either Marcel or Taylor has 15-ish, 20 points. Like, they're the ones that get going. I would assume that would mean Purdue probably doubles and Burns, you see him end with seven, eight assists, um, something something like maybe not that many, but like that type of performance there. Um, those are the on, on NC State. Those are kind of the two things that, that worry me the most is just the guards and DJ Burns getting going from a facilitating standpoint. And then on the other end, Purdue just has to like if Purdue doesn't shoot the ball well or it's turnovers, that's the been the killer for Purdue is when they turn the ball over like that's when things start to happen. I mean, they're the number two ranked offense in the country right now uh, per Ken Palm. And it's, it's just with how well they rebound the ball and, and NC state has been, you know, they're solid. They're not like great rebounding, just getting a shot on the rim with ED on there is so important. And that's where uh, turning the ball over is, is such a huge thing. So NC state forces some turnovers, gets Purdue to miss some threes, gets their guards going. That's kind of the, the script in my head of how this game would go. So looking kind of forward to the other game, the Alabama versus UConn game, what are some of the things that, you know, Purdue has advantage wise over these teams and is, I mean, of course, I'm not going to ask which team do you think they have the biggest advantages over because naturally it's probably not UConn. Yeah. But, you know, if UConn is to come out of this, what are some of the things that you think that y'all can do to kind of, I guess, suppress what they've been doing because they have been making this look pretty easy thus far. And on the counter of that, what are some of the things that you see from Alabama um, that could potentially cause some issues? So, yeah, starting with UConn, I mean, and I, I, on, my, on my Purdue show, I got some flack for this, but like UConn's mm -hmm. the best team in the country. It's just, they are, they are, they are on another level. Yeah. Um, I think I do think coming into this tournament, I kind of held this belief that Purdue was the only team that could give them a legitimate run. Uh, maybe, and there's always the outliers, right? If Bama comes out and hits 19 threes or something stupid, like yes, they can. They can obviously win that game. Yeah. Um, but in general, right? Like, like Purdue was the team that could actually give them some some issues. Um, I think a lot of it starts with Edie, and I know Klingon's been so so dominant. Clinton only plays like right. what did he play against Illinois? And then I guess it was a little bit of a blowout at the end. So it changes, but he played 22. I mean, 
like Klingon's only played, I'm looking now, he's only played over 30 minutes twice this entire season. Um, that's something that I think doesn't get talked about enough with Edie. Edie sat 33 seconds against Tennessee. And I understand the foul thing is a, is a hot topic, but like objectively he was getting mauled, whether there should have been more fouls on Edie, whatever. Like he was getting mauled the whole game. He sat 33 seconds and dropped 40. Like, mm-hmm. um, so that'll be the big, I think the thing that pops out first is can ED one get Klingon kind of in foul trouble or at least like not allow Klingon to do Klingon things defensively. Um, and then take care of, or not take care of, take advantage of Johnson when he does come in for 15 minutes a game. Um, I mean, it just going through like, it, it's, it's tough because I mean, brain Smith would have to have a really good game in the pick and roll, but UConn's very like, they're good at defending the pick and roll. It, it's something that they've done well this year. Um, I would, just, it's going to have to be the jumpers. Like if, if it isn't Edie in the post, it, it really does have to be jumpers. Cause like, I don't trust anybody driving to the rim against Klingon. I mean, Klingon just held like Terrence Shannon that who Terrence Shannon's probably the best guard at getting to the rim in the country. Like, yeah. Fletcher lawyer is not going to do that against Klingon or not going to do well against Klingon. So it'll be jumpers. It's brain Smith going to have to be kind of getting to his mid range off the pull up, spraying out to shooters. Um, and then it, it, it might just be ED going for 35, 40 again, uh, defensively it's controlling just the guards and, and Purdue as not that's the one area defensively Purdue isn't great. They're going to try to just funnel everything to ED and, and but UConn just has so many shooters and such good movements. Um, it would be just it, Purdue would have to stay attached. Purdue has to stay attached to their screens and stuff. And that's kind of, um, I, I think I've kind of gone away from the actual question, but those are kind of some of the things that pop up. Uh, switching to Bama, I mean, they did play once this year. Uh, Purdue did win. That was in Toronto um, early in the season. That was a game where uh, I forget how many threes Bama had in the first half. They ended up with 19. Bama went 19 for 46 from three that game. Um, they went 10 of 18 from two. And Purdue did end up winning um, in large part because they also knocked down some shots and they, they dominated the glass. Edie had 35 and seven. And that's the first thing is, and as it should be for basically every matchup is, hey, if Purdue matches up with Bama, like what are they going to do with Edie? Um, he put up 35 on 12 of 20 shooting. Bama, sh- like Bama, I, Bama had missed, made their like first six threes in that game. It was something stupid. Um, but that's something that Bama can do, and they can absolutely do that. P- Purdue has the advantage inside. Um, Sears versus Smith is, is a fun matchup if that were to happen. They're both two of the top point guards in the country. Um, Smith kind of, I mean, Smith and Sears both went off that game. Smith had 27 and eight. Sears had 35 points. Like uh, he hit eight threes that game. So those are kind of the things I would look at from right there. Um, I don't think I'm trying to find now. I don't think Bama's like an insanely good rebounding team. Yeah, Bama's a bad rebounding team. They don't force a ton of turnovers. They foul a lot, which is all things that favor Purdue. Um, but like yeah. I said, if Bama hits 19-3, sometimes it's tough to guard that. Yep. Uh, you know, between the two shows that I host, uh, this one and Illini Cast, you know, most of my attention uh, in order just to be knowledgeable about what I'm talking about lays on the big 10. So I tend to, you know, watch more big 10 tape than anyone else. And, you know, hand up, like I knew UConn was good, but I didn't actually watch them play until essentially we were matched up against them after Iowa state. And five minutes after watching some tape, I'm like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> wow. Cause I mean, I've been touting, you know, Purdue as the best team. Like they've been my pick to win it all uh, since the beginning of this year. And technically I, I haven't changed that uh, opinion either because I'll explain right afterwards. Um, But UConn kind of looks like Purdue. Obviously, Purdue Mm -hmm. has the edge at center, but UConn has a very good center in itself. But UConn surrounds their guys with NBA players, Mm -hmm. you know, like taller wing, like wing type of players. Whereas Purdue, like in Braden Smith, fantastic point guard, you know, arguably the best point guard in the country, but like, he's not going to be playing at the next level uh, anytime soon. Like he's going to be a college basketball player at least next year. So there's definitely a distinct size advantage when it comes to UConn. And so let me ask you, what's going to be the bigger battle? Is it going to be UConn versus Purdue on the court or Purdue Twitter plus is UConn against UConn Twitter off the court? Cause geez, as an Illinois fan, now that I've dealt with both fan bases, I am marveled at. So Purdue and uh, Illinois fan bases, I always say, is kind of very similar to each other in the sense where 
we're we're bratty, we're you know condescending, but at the same time, when we talk inwardly, uh, we're kind of like humble. We we don't have that success. Passive aggressive is what y'all are from from an outsider's view looking in. It's fair. You, UConn <laughs> is aggressive aggressive. There is no game that they don't play where they're like, you're wasting our time. Give us the trophy. We're winning by two. You know, there's going to be blood on the streets. The arrogant, like, you know, yeah. Joe's being very humble. Like even this, uh, you know, interview. He's like, you know, yeah, I, I think, you know, I was pretty confident we would win the earlier games and stuff like that. I had, you know, I mean, I had had some interactions with UConn folks. I had a UConn guy on my Illini cast, and afterwards, like he had me convinced we'd lose by like thirty points, and that's what happened. Again, you know, it's just based on uh, this experience. So. That's the battle that I'm really looking forward to seeing. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate that we are only going to have 48 hours to see those yeah. two fan bases go at it. Yeah. And there's there's like some history over the past two years. I try to stay out of it because uh, <laughs> it just that's when it, that's because. OK, so I didn't grow up really with social media at all. And then I'm I'm 24. So like I that's good was thing. coming in the age where it was like, you know, I didn't get it till I was like seven, 16, 17. And I didn't start doing this till like two years to go. And I told myself I was like. The only way you're doing this is that like you have fun, like you yeah. just you have to stay having fun. And I'm not perfect, but for the most part, I stay away. But like last year, there was the whole and even this year, like the who should be ranked number one in the AP. Like there's been back and forth with all that. So like there's already some like previous beef, quote unquote. And uh, yeah, Twitter. I mean, Purdue, Illinois would have been something on Twitter, but Purdue, UConn also would be. I Yeah, it, it'll be something on Twitter. I might just mute Twitter for that for that that time period and call it good. Yeah, delete the app for the yep. yeah hours. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll go ahead and I guess we can get to uh, I guess a little bit of a prediction um, here. Girl, you don't have to make a prediction if you don't want to. Like, okay. uh, yeah. you know, I don't know if, if Illinois was involved. I don't know if I would uh, be able to make the prediction. So we'll leave that up to you. But uh, Justin, why don't you go first? Um, for this game, yeah, I think Purdue. I, I think Purdue is going to win by double digits in this game. I, I do think it's going to be something where NC State. I think they're going to be playing physical and they're going to be playing, but I think they might get into some foul trouble. And I, I just think as the game goes on, Purdue's going to kind of NC State. You know, they've been on a good run, but all of these Cinderella stories come to an end eventually. There's going to be a team that they all – or there usually is a team that they face that they just can't overcome, and I think Purdue's just too good. And the fact that their best weapon has to go against a guy like Zach Eady, that's tough. And um, so, I, you know, I think they'll scrap. I think they'll fight. But at the end of the day, they're just going to – they're going to fold late. And I, I would say they'll – oh, man. I would say like maybe 82-69. Something like that. Sounds about right. I, I think both final four games are going to be blowouts. Um, I actually think the Alabama game might be a little bit closer than the Purdue-NC State game just because at some point UConn needs to be at least – I mean, they haven't had a game within 13 in the last two years. So I mean, I'm not saying this one's going to be under 13, but um, I just think Purdue is kind of locked in. Uh, you know, they've got that business mindset um, and – I think they'll take care of NC State. You know, again, great story, great Cinderella story, but Final Fours is usually where the Cinderella stories uh, come to die a little bit, which sets up the Battle of the Titans. You know, I think inarguably the two best teams in the country pretty much all year long. And I'm going to – I actually predicted Purdue to win it all at the beginning of the season in our bracket – and I'm not going to change my mind. I'm actually going to say that Purdue figures out a way to win this game um, for a couple of reasons. The main reason being, it is really, really hard to repeat in college basketball. I mean, it hasn't been done in a very, very long time. And granted, UConn is built and talented enough to be that team to repeat. But I think if UConn was going up against a different team, um, uh, you know, a talented team, that was just kind of pure talent, it could be different. But Purdue is not quite at an equal footing, but pretty close. And they've got the best player in the country, arguably the best player in a generation on their side, along with, you know, a top three, top four head coach who he's just waiting for it. Like that's the one last brass ring that he needs to get. I think story-wise, um, you know, losing to the 16 seed last year. You know, if, if you watch sports as as long as I have, you know, you can see 
the culmination of everything that Purdue fans have kind of had to deal with for the past few years, um, you know, reach its peak and reach, you know, its point of validation on Monday night. And I have Purdue winning. I'm going to say it's a very close game, but I think the Boilermakers uh, end up being the champions. All right, Joe. Um, I'll just, I'm going to, I do think Purdue beats NC State. Um, and I'm just not going to make a championship pick because I don't want to. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I think it'll be, it'll be close. I, I picked UConn in my bracket over Purdue in the championship is, is what I had. Um, I just want to throw this out there really quick, but like the irony that like Purdue finally makes a final four and they get a double digit seed. Like, <laughs> yeah, like come on. <laughs> that's what I, you know, I was joking around with earlier, you know, it, it's going to be hilarious that by some chance, if you guys do lose, Mm-hmm. You know, at least like segments of Illini Twitter are just going to have fun with that too. You're like, yeah. oh, oh, really? Yeah. Four straight years losing to a double digit seed? You know, it's uh, just two fan bases being silly with each other. But just yeah. let's hear what you think. Yeah. Um, well, just in general, like the NC State game. Yeah, I think that's going to be like I said, eighty two sixty nine. Then the the national championship. Yeah, UConn Purdue, man, that's so tough because I'm going back and forth in my mind. It's just like it's one of those things where I feel like UConn has had such you know, such dominating performances so far. Like, I feel like at some point, maybe they're going to struggle. Then at the same time, I think UConn's the type of team that's just going to be able to get up for that game and just come out and play their brand of basketball. So it's going to be very dependent on that. Um, I think right now I would side with UConn slightly, but I'll see how these games go and see if, um, you know, maybe UConn has some slip ups against Bama or how Purdue comes out because eventually at the I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, it's just about getting hot at the right time. And so if they can come out of these games, whoever come out of this game with momentum out of this final four games, that's going to give them a lot of confidence going into the to the next game. So yeah. um, I think these first games are going to be very important just to see how they're coming out of them, and how they're going into that national championship game. And UConn, they they've done it's highlighted by Hurley. They've done a great job of. Uh, I'm trying to find a nicer word. Just like the there's it, with all the greats, all the great athletes and teams, you that that psychoticness of like, oh yeah, uh, everybody's yeah. counting us out. Like nobody's counted out UConn, but they, I truly think they believe that everybody's counting yeah. them out. Which is just like, kudos to them for having like being able to find that mentality after winning last year, um, and being as dominant as they've been. But. I got in trouble for that because uh, in the post game, uh, Dan Hurley made a comment about like a, I don't even know if he's still an ESPN analyst. He's a former Illini player who made a tweet, something along the lines of, you know, uh, you kind of hasn't played uh, a physical player like Terrence Shannon Jr. in the, uh, in the big East ball, something along that, those lines. And Dan Hurley brought that up saying, you know, I saw that. And, uh, you know, I felt like they weren't taking us seriously. The big East, you know, is what prepared us for this battle. And in a tweet, I just got like, I said very jokingly, lightheartedly, that Dan Hurley is a psychopath. But I mean it in the sense like my favorite athlete of all time, Michael Jordan, was a psychopath. Yeah. You know, Kobe yeah. was a psychopath. There's just a certain personality type. That's Cerebral. Just, it, it, yeah, they just look for that little end just to gain energy from it. So, you know, get a new level of aggression uh, unlocked. And Dan Hurley is just one of those type of, uh, personality, which is funny because him and Painter are just so complete opposite um, yeah. when it comes to you know their styles of uh, communicating. But I'm really looking forward to you know the battle. Hopefully, um, yes, well, for you. Hopefully, and for me, it's, we'll see what happens. We as college basketball fans deserve like that. We deserve UConn versus Purdue. That would yeah. be an amazing. Yeah, absolutely. That would be must watch TV. I, I agree. Yeah, if we get Bama NC State. <laughs> not watching but all right well i appreciate you uh joe for taking the time to come on again um do you want to one more time just tell people where they can find you and again his links to his stuff will be in the description of the video so go down there and click and support but yeah go ahead and tell people where they can find you one more time yeah so on twitter at joe jackson cbb and then youtube is feed the post and that's where i've had like my full length scouting reports out um for these ncaa tournament games and then i'll have uh, I'll have breakdowns of like all the newcomers, like transfers and freshmen in the off season. And, and so stuff will still be coming out definitely during the summer. Cool. So y'all get over there, even if you're a big 10 fan and uh, get the uh, scouting report on Purdue. Sonny, anything from you before we close? No, uh, just uh, check out Joe's webpage uh, hope, or YouTube page. And uh, hopefully, you know, now that 
there's no real off season in college basketball anymore. Like these games are going on and people are transferring left and right. Uh, maybe we'll have Joe back on at some point and kind of review some of the big moves and how they might be fit on their uh, new Big Ten teams. Yeah, definitely. Nebraska lost pretty much their whole team to the floor. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> so um, my off season will be fun. So. <laughs> But all right, everybody. Well, thank you for tuning in to the Big Ten Show. If you like what we're doing here, please consider liking and subscribing. We're on the road to 1,000 subs. Got a lot of fun stuff coming up for y'all in the next few months as we prep for the basketball offseason and football spring practice starting up. So we will catch y'all in the next video. Peace.